the transparency that I've seen from our leaders and the vulnerability just in general. I think I remember the first week uh, we went on, came on in all hands and we had our leaders basically say, we don't know what the future holds, right? We don't know. Um, and I think that that type of vulnerability is, is rarely expressed by CEOs and leaders. Um, you know, usually as a CEO and as a leader, you want to say, this is the direction and, and we know exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, that feeling like we were all in this together was, was a really proud moment. Hey everyone, I'm Chris Ronzio, founder and CEO of Trainual, and this is Process Makes Perfect. As always, we're talking with experts in process creation, automation, and delegation. Basically, the people that know how to make business easier. You just heard from Becky Karsh. Becky's the head of people development at Uber in the US and Canada. And in this episode, we talk about how to navigate massive cultural shifts, which Becky's navigated several during her time at Uber. This was taken as a clip from our training with Empathy event that we hosted back with Empathy Wines in April of 2020. And what I love about this is that Becky just gives great advice. She's candidly been leading a team through a lot of shifts from the, the entrance into COVID and the massive workforce change to the CEO changeover that happened a few years back. So she has some great perspective and I think you'll learn a lot. Can this business thrive without the owner? You've got to start putting systems and processes in place. If you don't use the systems, the business will break. We're always looking to buy back our time. You cannot say something once and expect that it actually is received. This is the way we work. A big motivation in that for me is creating a job for myself that I really enjoy. This is how you discover your vision. And this is Process Makes Perfect. Hey, Becky. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. It's been such a great morning listening in on all these uh, these conversations and following the chat. I love the interactivity of today. Me too. I've been in, well, Jonathan was presenting. I was like looking at Twitter and answering Q&A and this is so fun. So thank you for everyone that is collaborating, participating, and please keep the questions coming in the Q&A. Uh, so for everyone just tuning in, I'd love to introduce and welcome to the virtual stage, Becky Karsh. Becky's the head of people development in the US and Canada for Uber. She brings years of experience from teaching, working in small companies and building her own startup. So she's guided by her personal mission to build more inquisitive and inclusive workplaces, which I love. Becky has driven both individual and team transformations across organizations of all sizes. So thank you again, welcome Becky. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to this conversation. Me too. So this one is titled Navigating Massive Cultural Shifts at Uber. And when you and I talked a couple of weeks ago, that was the theme from the conversation was, wow, you have been through so many big shifts. And for companies that are much smaller, these shifts can be just, uh, you know, overwhelming. And for, for you, you've gone through a few of these. Totally. Um, so I've been at Uber for four years. Um, in fact, I, I was there at the very beginning of our people development team um, when we really started first introducing the idea of development to, to Uber. Um, and it has been a, a roller coaster, I would say, um, a series of ups and downs. And I think that um, even though Ubers have been very public and in the news, uh, I imagine that it is not uncommon for companies, especially startups, um, big and small, to go through their own version of the roller coaster. So I think that understanding how to navigate these shifts and these changes. I mean, what we're going through right now, just a massive global uh, change. It's, it's you know, it, it takes a lot of um, uh, knowledge and, and information and um, training. I mean, I think training through empathy is, is a perfect, perfect title for that because it's really understanding how to manage through these changes. So we're going to dig into it. And I thought the best way to frame the discussion would be if we focused on past, present, and future. Because in the past, anybody that's ever watched the news or heard of Uber in the news is familiar with the leadership changes that have happened. So we could talk about that. Right now, you're in the center of this you know, remote work uh, movement with you know, Uber Eats and how influential th that's been. And then the, just the changes to Uber's drive, uh, regular rideshare service. Um, and then looking ahead, there's been a lot, just a lot of talk about how autonomous vehicles and these things might change the workforce. And so if there was a company globally that's dealt with change, I, I, I think Uber's the one. So, so we'll dig in. Great. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been um, 
a very public public version of changes. So I'm okay, happy to so, share. So as we get started, I, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your background. I know you have an education background. So how, how did you get from, um, you know, from what you did in school into this people role? Totally. Um, I think uh, similar to, to what Amy said, um, we, <laughs> I was a music major, uh, so not a, quite a poetry major, but I was a, a music education major, very interested in the arts and teaching and um, uh, went and became a music teacher uh, and then kind of got interested in this idea of how to scale how people learn. So um, just kind of use that in my career, just um, uh, joined a bunch of startups, ended up building a startup around college to career training. So really filling that skills gap, which I think actually still exists, even though this was many years ago, um, around why why aren't we preparing our college students for the workforce? And then got really interested in, in what does it look like to be trained in the workforce or, or what are those actual essential skills? Um, so started looking around for roles that would be um, inside of a company, but also had that startup feel that was interested in experimentation and innovation. Um, so, so yeah, my background's in, in education. Um, I'm always, I've always been fascinated by how people learn. Um, and I think I've worked uh, at every level of, of person, um, a, including, uh, uh, you know, elderly education to uh, pre-K education. So um, it's just really interested in kind of building that growth mindset and, and that inquisitive nature in people. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I ended up at Uber. I feel like this, the, the people departments have really emerged in the last few years and it's been a shift on the traditional HR kind of mindset where now people is this, this really all encompassing thing that's like you employee experience and it's, and it takes a really holistic view to be able to do well in this. And so it, the fact that you came from music and Amy came from, uh, from, you know, art and things is, is no surprise. Um, so walk us through just what, what's your role like today as the head of people development for, for Uber? Yeah, so um, I oversee uh, a region. I oversee the U.S. Canada region of fourteen thousand people. Um, with uh, um, my team and I, we basically go in. We do needs analysis, diagnostics around what's going on in different organizations um, at different levels, and we uh, provide solutions. So sometimes that involves getting in front of the business and doing some training. Sometimes that involves working with a vendor to spin something up. Sometimes that involves um, a different type of intervention because. Not, it's not always training that's the answer, um, and I think that's the l and secret is, is there's a lot more to it. There's uh, thinking, creating mindsets and, and actions around driving your own growth and your own development. Um, so, yeah, the day-to-day -day is, is different every day, um, but really it's working closely hand-in-hand -hand with the business to ensure we're, we're providing our people with the best opportunities to learn and grow um, and do the best they can at their, in their roles. And, and is that investment in people across the entire organization from employees to drivers? How, how do you think about investing and growing people? Yeah, so we um, are business facing. So we are in within the Uber business, so not driver facing, but there are tons of really wonderful programs that are created by, for our drivers actually by the business. So um, we do have like a marketing and a product team that's really focused on drivers and couriers and providing them the best experience possible. Um, they launched a uh, I think it was last year, two years ago, a partnership with ASU, which was, um, you know, providing benefits around education. So um, we definitely care tremendously about our, 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 par our drivers and couriers. Um, but uh, my personal role is looking after uh, the, the folks in the business. The, the business of running the business. Business of running the business, yes. But it, that is a common question I do, I do get asked. So, all right. So let's let's pivot then into change. Um, when you think about just uh, change in general, you've been through a lot of them. Does Uber have a specific framework or an approach to how you deal with change? Yeah, I think um, there's a few ways that we really think about change. One is 
um, thinking about change along uh, the, a framework we provide for managers. And I, I heard managers come up so much today, um, and it really is true. They are the the pulse of the organization, right? You have uh, managers who are who are are managed by senior leaders and are managing big teams, and they really have to be the driving force. So we equip them with some frameworks to use, um, and one very common one that um, I'm sure folks on the call may have, have used in the past is the Kubler-Ross change curve. Um, and that was developed in the 1960s to talk about grief, this five stages of grief um, that, that might be more common. Um, and our team really simplified it into these, these four areas, thinking about um, how, how you go from uh, the initial shock of a change into this place of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is not linear, right? You're not just all of a sudden, oh, change happens. I feel great. I'm going to go back to work. Um, and I think a perfect example is this, uh, the magnitude of, of the scale of which we're dealing with um, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, you know, I think that a lot of folks really experienced in that first week, what is, what's going on? Like, I don't even feel, I, I, I can't work or, you know, I have these other extenuating circumstances. There was so much um, confusion around that time that it really, um, the change curve, I think, really helped our managers navigate through that, which is just um, to briefly highlight the four stages uh, the f that we that we share. There's a lot of different versions out there, um, but we share the first stage being denial, that initial shock, and then kind of this uh, confusion, denial, I can't deal with this. And then there's uh, goes into resistance, which is kind of a dip down low. Um, you know, I don't want to deal with this or the, you know, in other instances, the way we did it before was better. Um, and then kind of moving up into from resistance into acceptance. Okay, this is the way it's going to be. I accept what this looks like. Um, and then all the way up and to the right to commitment, um, which is really I'm committed to making this work and, and I want to be a part of the solution. So um, most, most of the time folks don't jump from denial to commitment. Um, and so if you're a manager and you're equipped with this, you can say, you can even use this to, with your teams. Hey, what stage of the change curve are you in? Where, where are you with this crisis? Or where are you with this org change um, or leader leaving? Or, you know, there, there's, it's, it's a really nice tight framework that you can use as a manager and for yourself. That is a great process. I, would, I wouldn't have thought to ask someone what stage they're in and present that, but just having that simple framework, it, it lets you identify where someone is at and how they're dealing with it. And I'd imagine everyone on the team is going to be dealing with it on a slightly different timeline. So it's not a blanket approach, right? Totally. Um, yeah, I think that it's, it's really understanding where people are at any given moment. Um, I think that a lot of folks talked about today that human connection, that human interaction, um, and it's, it's really in these small moments of kindness and understanding and check-ins in a one-on-one -on -one kind of setting yeah. where a manager can, can provide support and, and say, you know, where, where are you with this? And, and everyone kind of has their own different situation. And I don't think um, any situation is better or worse. They're just different. And some people have been through lots of change, right, and have a huge appetite, right? You're an adventurer, as Amy and uh, Jonathan were talking about. You have a huge appetite for change, and some people just don't. And and both are both are great. Like you, you know, we should we should have diversity of, of appetite for change, and it's it's just in how we support it that that I think is really critical. So so as companies or, or leaders that are you know wa are watching this, when you see a change, a big change coming down the pipeline, at, at what point do you need to? Uh, you know, plan the communication strategy and, you know, should, should the people teams be part of making those decisions or, you know, how, how has it been done well or not so well in your experience? Yeah, I think both. I think it, it just depends on the situation um, and depends on kind of the, uh, obviously Uber's had change big and small. Um, so uh, smaller changes, a lot of times the people team is involved in, you know, org changes or, um, or pivots to businesses, uh, introductions of new businesses, um, and, and the change management of that is so critical. It's, it's really critical to think through what are the different levels we need to talk through. I mean, you can even think of this in, in a version of, of your own teams, um, of the folks that, that work for you or work around you, is, is how do you think about communicating a change? 
to somebody, to someone's role, to the whole team, maybe somebody left. Um, so, so it's really interesting to think about those types of those steps. And then of course, there are some changes that are just, um, they're just things that HR and, and people are not involved in, right? Um, big uh, uh, business kind of uh, decisions, maybe Nikki, our head of HR at the top is really quite involved in that. But in terms of, of thinking through the change, sometimes it's out of our control. Um, sometimes things get <laughs> shared. Um, and so it, it's really a, a reaction to change. Um, but I do really, think that it's I, a proactive, collaborative type thing that you're involved and you can plan for the four stages, but sometimes it's just thrust upon you. Correct, correct. And so I, th I think it's really being prepared for both. And actually, that's kind of where resiliency comes in um, and teaching folks and building that resiliency muscle. Um, I think that just like empathy is something that can be taught, resiliency is something that can be taught. And, yeah. um, and, and I think that the more change you go through, the higher your appetite for change, the more resilient you become. Um, and the more um, the strength you have against these types of changes. So we do a lot of training around um, just building resiliency and um, a, an appetite for change and, and understanding how to not only just go to your manager or kind of wallow in change, but really how to check in with yourself in terms of, of how am I dealing with this, with this change? So yeah. um, it's kind of a combination of both. Well, I, I'm definitely going to come back to that at the end because I want to hear how you train for resiliency. But for right now, I want to go into this this uh, past, present, future thing. So if we could go back a couple years, everyone saw Uber in the news with the big leadership CEO change. So when Travis made a change out of the business or, or whatever, um, first of all, how, how what was that like from inside of the organization? Did it feel unsettling or, or how did you perceive it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think anybody who's gone through a CEO change, and and keep in mind, there's been a lot of a lot of tech companies that have gone through CEO changes, um, maybe not quite as public, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely uns unsettling, and um, uh, you know, just going through that as an employee was was it was interesting, and um, I think it was it was just kind of like what's you know you, you want to know what's next, you know, you want to know. Yeah. What, what's to come? What does this mean? Um, oftentimes employees will think, what does this mean for me? Uh, and I think that's a big part of change management is just addressing that. Uh, I think that the company did a really good job. Um, Leanne at the time, who was our head of HR, she did a really great job of, of talking to the company. Um, we happen to really be focusing on building trust within the organization. Um, actually, uh, Frances Fry, who came in a couple years ago to do some work with us, just released her article about the work that she did. Um, and uh, for those of you, it's, it's in the, H the current issue of HBR. I, I recommend it. It's about Uber and um, the trust triangle. And that was something that we were really kind of building on and, and the three areas of the trust triangle, um, empathy, uh, authenticity, and logic. Mm -hmm. So teaching that, building resiliency through like kind of training on trust and giving our managers better tools. Um, and then change happens, right? The Travis, you know, um, is no longer CEO. What does this mean? And it's really communicating with managers to communicate with employees, build, um, build that kind of uh, foundation of trust within organizations. I also think it's a really brilliant time for leaders to step in and, and offer transparency, authenticity. Um, I've seen a lot of that. I know we're not in the present talk yet, but I've seen a lot of that come from our leaders um, in the last few weeks. And I think that really builds confidence in managers and employees that uh, we're, we're on a ship that's like, that's heading in some sort of direction. So, um, you know, after the initial shock, I think there was probably some resistance, but I think as a company, we've really moved quickly towards that commitment place, of course, Dara coming in was a, was a big change as well. Yeah, I imagine it was it was hard. I, did you hear any common themes bubbling up as it, you know it, your teams? I mean, fourteen thousand people. Were there were there a lot of concerns, or what was the mechanism for collecting employee feedback to be able to address it? Yeah, we actually, so th there was a lot of um, listening sessions. We did a lot of listening sessions with employees. Um, really that FaceTime is super important, right? We do pull surveys and the usual culture checks and things like that, but that's really not um, 
a good check-in during a time like that. And so uh, we, we as the people team really went out into the business to listen, to hear what concerns were. I mean, there were, you know, when, when things kind of came out in, in 2017, um, there were tons of listening sessions yeah. um, because some people felt like that was their experience and some people didn't. And it was really reconciling mm. this understanding of who we were, what we were doing as a culture, where we were going. Um, and, and those listening sessions led to a lot of really important work around um, developing new cultural values and setting new direction um, and investing in our people, investing in our managers. Um, and so, and yeah, it was, it was really about connecting directly with the business. There's really no replacement for that human and, and I mean, were you able to do it on kind of a, a mass scale where you did town halls or were they really just a lot of individualized meetings to be able to sort through those emotions? It was a little bit of both. Um, I think that different org leaders did different, um, different uh, interventions. So, uh, for example, our CTO had a meeting with the tech org and, you know, kind of led with authenticity and, and vulnerability. And it was, it was a really beautiful moment for him to bring together his org and, and just come out and share, you know, his, his feelings around everything. And, and everyone was, you know, everyone was upset, you know, we didn't, the, especially, I, I mean, I, I validate the experience of others, but I personally didn't feel that experience. Um, and so it was, it was a confusing time for me as well. So there were big town halls like that. And then there were smaller things, um, some focused on, you know, bringing together employee resource groups, uh, you know, different the women at Uber and um, different religions at Uber, just kind of hearing from different groups and, and hearing from different, um, different representatives. So it was kind of a combination. It was definitely uh, important to not take action too quickly. I think that's yeah. a, a mistake that companies often make is, is there's a problem. And so they're, they take action, but that's often a reaction mm. and not necessarily the, you know, the right response. And it can feel cold. If, mm -hmm. it, if you just act right away and you haven't given people time to process, I think it feels cold. So, you know, any big change like that is definitely an opportunity for the, the company to sort of set the new standard and say, here's what we're doing now. I remember the, the commercials that started coming out on TV with Dara and, uh, and, and the public sure. messaging. I'm sure there was also internal messaging. So how, how did you start to pivot and say, here's what we're all about now. Here's how we're going forward. You know, I don't think it was a moment in time. I think it, it took a lot of time. Um, in fact, I would say this moment in time is, it has been just um, like watching Uber step up during this COVID-19 crisis yeah. has just been an incredible moment in, in our life cycle. And, and um, over the last four years, I haven't seen anything like it, right? Even in that moment of when Dara came on and was like, we have, you know, we're going this direction, we set new values, we set new terms, all of that. I, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to come off as authentic, even if it is, yeah. right? Um, because we were coming off of such a big uh, negative experience from internal and ex internally and externally, um, it's hard for that to really break the noise, but I think it was starting to scratch the surface. I don't think he was trying to claim that we were something we were not. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely an interesting, um, interesting transition. And I think it takes time. I think it takes time to um, build, build brand loyalty as, as we all know, but also I think that internally um, we went through a lot of changes. We continued to go through a lot of changes. So yeah. it was, was not, um, you know, it wasn't just that moment in time that kind of shifted. Um, but I think that the people who were in that commitment phase, myself included, were like, okay, what can we do? Let's yeah. do this. Like, we believe in this mission. We believe in Uber. How can we help? And so it, it really took a company of, of folks who were believers to, to kind of propel us forward. So, so if that shift was over time and gradual, uh, the, the newest uh, issue, you know, the COVID-19 was more overnight. And I think maybe the difference between these two is, you know, when there's a leadership change at an organization, some, some part of the team knows it's coming or is involved in it, and then it trickles out and you respond or you react to the emotions. Whereas when something like this happened, this kind of took everyone by storm 
instantly. You know, there was there was sort of no <laughs> no trickling yeah. out of this. So, you know, let's let's go to the present, and I guess just more generally, how how have the last two months or month been for Uber? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different perspectives. There's the external and the internal, um, I, and I'm sort of su- I'm super proud of of both reactions. Um, like I said, I've, it's just been a really um, uh, amazing time to watch our leadership step up. Um, the transparency that I've seen from our leaders and the vulnerability, just in general. I think I remember the first week uh, we went on came on an all hands, and we had our leaders basically say we don't know what the future holds, right? We don't know. Um, And I think that that type of vulnerability is is rarely expressed by CEOs and leaders. Um, You know, usually as a CEO and as a leader, you want to say, this is the direction and and we know exactly what's going to happen. But I think that that feeling like we were all in this together was was a really proud moment. Um, And then, of course, they shifted into a gear of, we have this international network of, of um, business and and we can really make a difference. We can really help. Um, and so there was there was a whole movement to to shift towards what can we do to help um, and how can we how can we make a difference here. And then of course internally, um, the first thing we did we kind of spun up some live trainings. The first two weeks, I think I did more live virtual (laughs) trainings than I've ever done um, in that short span of time at Uber, Um, but really building community, virtual community around um, giving managers, equipping managers and individuals with the tools that they need. So talking through how to navigate through change. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, policies weren't even created yet, right? The first week, you don't have a policy on parenting and working um you you didn't even think that would be a thing everyone does now that's that now that's in every handbook (laughs) right it's i mean there's so many different things that that got spun up over the last few weeks but that initial first few weeks was really a lot around um uh, of just support we're here um you know we're we're gonna open up these zoom calls and and all of that so it's super um it's really about that feeling of support, giving that support to the business from from a people team. Um, and then, you know, we really wanted from leadership and from HR to, to come across as things are, it's okay to be empathetic with yourself as well, right? You don't want to just say, you know, you don't want to just carry a load from your employees. You really want to be empathetic with um, how you're feeling and understanding how you're feeling and saying it's okay to be confused or stressed or, um, working through other things right now. And, and that type of openness, I think, really set the tone for how we were going to um, yeah. work with employees through this. Well, what you said earlier about leadership saying, look, we don't know. I mean, that, that kind of vulnerability and transparency, I feel like it reduces the pressure that you might put on yourself to feel like you have all the answers. And so if you I think that's a, such a great suggestion, it's okay to say you don't know. You're not sure how this is going to play out. None of us are. So um, really great point there. Uh, I was just going to ask about community building and Jordan in the chat said the same thing. Do you have any best practices or things that you've done to, to help foster these virtual communities? Totally. Um, We've built online learning communities. Um, We have uh, our ERGs putting out tons of different uh, community building opportunities. Tomorrow's Bring Your Kid to Work Day. They're building a whole virtual Bring Your Kid to Work Day. Um, We uh, use Slack to build kind of that that, uh, asynchronous community. And then um, a lot of times it's just setting up time to chat. So virtual community is larger. It's like hey, let's get some managers together. We have a bi-weekly manager uh, training that we really use as just community building. So we break people out into Zoom rooms um, and they can learn and chat with other, um, learn and chat with other managers and, um, you know, providing resources of of how to connect, when to connect, um, and really empowering different groups to connect with each other. Yeah. Um, with that said, we've also got gotten a ton of requests for different development opportunities from the business. So my team has had to shift very quickly from what have we done live and how can we make it virtual um, and building like that virtual training experience. So so people can have that um, asynchronous or synchronous learning experience. 
Well, from what I've heard from other employees at Uber, you've already done a great job building communities and you, you've you got Nubers and Zubers and all the all these different groups. And you mentioned like uh, the different religions. And, and so is this something you've you've put a lot of work into in advance that now is just thriving in this virtual setting? Totally. Um, so our our DNI team is incredible. I'm they they were built up a few years ago, and um, our, our DNI leader Bo is is amazing. But she, they really invested a ton in employee resource groups, and and they are super critical to the culture at Uber. They are really the backbone of our culture and do tons of work and have tons of support um, and uh, and leadership support, executive leadership support, and I think that that. Um, that really has helped us rebuild our culture. Um, so, so there's, there's that piece. And then the Nuber thing is super interesting, um, because, uh, the, um, the person who runs onboarding sits on my team and, and she immediately had to spin up into action of what is virtual onboarding look like, um, and work with the IT team and the people teams and just to create a really connected experience virtually. And so she spun up Slack groups and, um, is doing a, a big virtual onboarding day tomorrow, uh, with leaders. And it's, it's really been, I mean, it's been a great time for innovation and creativity. Well, that's amazing to hear. I know, you know, we, we had eight people start on Monday remotely that I, we've never met. And, you know, companies that are hiring more have, have this new pressure to make the employee experience remotely just as good as the one that would happen in your office. So hopefully we can lead the way and provide some good examples to companies that haven't hired anyone yet. Um, the, the last question on this, the present issue is, you know, you've, you've shifted from what was always a, a rideshare service to now this big focus on delivery. And it, as you've made that business pivot, how quickly have you had to train your existing people or retool your existing people on, on the way to get things done? How do you keep from it being a fire hose? Um, it's never, it's never not a fire hose at Uber. I think what, one of the things I love about working at Uber is it, it constantly feels like a startup with it, but it's a big company. Um, there's always new things to learn, um, tons of growth and, uh, our team really does a lot around how to navigate and drive your own growth. Um, because it is not scalable for me to sit in front of a room and teach people how to learn, um, and, or how to do something. Right. And so if you teach somebody to fish, right, you teach them how to learn and how, and how to access those resources. Um, so a lot of it is just kind of being thrown in and, and, and uh, drinking from the fire hose and learning from others. Luckily our tools and systems internally are, um, kind of build upon each other. So uh, I, I imagine folks who are kind of shifting gears during this time um, are, you know, getting spun up pretty quickly. Um, and, and I think there's a big um, internal feeling of, of let's do this, which is, which is so motivating for, for employees in general is just kind of building that culture of banding together to, to build something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I think the other the other piece is just um, ensuring that uh, we're we're continuing to to be an arm for support to provide different types of resources um, to ensure that employees can kind of navigate that for themselves. Yeah. So so outside of this environment with COVID nineteen, I remember for years working with companies that um, would talk about change management and resistance to change internally. And if you don't have buy in, if you don't have the culture that supports change, where everyone's like, "Let's do this," like you just said, then it's hard to do. So it's it's probably that that's probably where you start, right? Is building the momentum around this is an environment where we can make changes because otherwise it would be hard to pivot as quickly as you have. Totally. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to claim that we, we have no fear of change because I think that's, that's a natural part of any organization, but um, we really do try and encourage kind of experimentation and removing that fear of failure. And um, that really has to come from kind of the culture and come from the top. And so right. um, I think, you know, we talk about internally that we take big, bold bets and that's, that's part of it is let's, let's try some stuff. And, and um, that's kind of what our company was built upon. 
Yeah, I love that. Okay, so let's go to part three of this, the future. So the other thing that pops up in the news all the time is what Uber's doing with drones and what Uber's doing with autonomous vehicles. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, pizzazz and, and the technology that, that you guys have is at the, the forefront, I guess. So um, when it comes to empathy and how some of that tech could disrupt your existing team or the drivers that you support, how does that play into the equation? So this is a question that Travis used to get a lot. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's, it's a lack of empathy or thinking about what, what the future holds for our current drivers or couriers. Um, because one, I don't think that's going away in the short term. Um, I think even as these new technologies get spun up, I think there will be kind of a simultaneous side-by-side -side approach. Um, but two, I do think that there is a little bit of um, uh, what does what does the future hold, right? What the future of work? What are what do future careers hold? And the best thing that Uber can do, and and that we do try and and do for our drivers and couriers is is continue to upskill, right? Um, we have a huge internal um, program around our community specialists, which are community operators, um, of training in new skills and hiring them into Uber. Full, you know, uh, for for different roles, different operational roles, different sometimes uh, tech, uh, engineering roles, product roles. Um, those types of things are super important, and it's, so it's not it's not necessarily a, an an Uber thing. It's kind of a future of work thing. Is how do we continue to upskill folks to think about what the future of of working looks like? Um, I think in the short term for drivers and couriers, this this work does not go away. Um, but I do think that our current um, our, our current uh, uh, state with COVID nineteen, I think that a lot of stuff is going to change in the near term, right? Around around work and what that looks like. And so I think it's it's important to just continue to upskill. Um, one of our newest businesses that was launched, Uber Works. I'm a huge fan of it because I'm, I I love to think of on the future of work and what that looks like. And it's really on that kind of how do you provide these just-in-time jobs and opportunities for folks? And I think the gig economy is only going to get bigger. And I think there's only going to be more opportunities within that. Um, so whether it's a driver, a courier, um, delivery, or something else, um, there will always be a need to move things, right? That's that's kind of Uber's whole mission. So, um, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's almost like the, the most empathetic thing that you can do would be to train on skills for where you think the future is headed. You know, if you weren't, if you weren't doing any sort of preparation to, to be ready for that, then maybe you're lacking in empathy. But the fact that you're, you're thinking about it and creating training programs internally and helping people is, you know, you, you can't help but, uh, but see the, the future with, uh, with everything you guys are working on. So I think you're doing a great job. We've, we've got a, a bunch of questions that are coming in, but I'll start by going back to the one I asked at the beginning that I postponed, which is how do you train resilience? Yeah, I think that um, resilience, just like um, change management, it's kind of a thing that you provide some frameworks for around um, how to think about building an appetite for um, shifts and change and, and your response and measuring your response um, and understanding kind of uh, introspectively what your appetite for change is um, and then applying it. I, I, um, something called the GI Joe effect came out of a uh, Yale researcher. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, but I yeah. guess GI Joe used to say um, knowing is half the battle. And she, the researcher at Yale actually says that's not true. Knowing is not half the battle. It's applying it. And as, as learning professionals, we know that that's the case, right? We know mm -hmm. that when you apply something, you learn it. So for us, um, any sort of training, we think of the 70, 20, 10 a lot, right? We think of, and you know, whatever you feel about those those ratios, the bulk of learning happens on the job. And we think of ourselves as the, like a resiliency training is like a 10% thing. So it's giving people the tools, right? It's giving people the change curve or the trust triangle, and then saying, here's how to apply it in these times of, of change. Um, and I think that the more change we go through as a company, the more resilient we come, become as a company. And I think that our current response to what's happening is kind of an example of that, of of how we've built resiliency over time. 
Do you notice a difference between employees that have been with the team for a long time versus ones that are new in terms of how they navigate change? Um, possibly. I think, I think that it, it also depends on kind of um, folks coming in may have a super huge appetite for change, right? That might be why they're joining. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, people who have been here a long time may still be kind of in that place of, uh, uh, Amy talked about like needing certainty, which um, is definitely kind of a, you know, a, a response to change is I need, I need something concrete. Um, and, you know, the, the idea is, is, is not to change your idea of how you um, approach that, but it's kind of, okay, why am I reacting like this? And how can I build certainty from change? Or how can I, how can I build what I need and what my team needs from our current moment? Hmm. I love that. Okay. Um, let's see. Rui asks, uh, what does Becky look for when hiring specifically for her team? So, so someone wants a job, I think, but what, what, what do you, what do you look for? I actually have um, two criteria. It goes beyond this, but two criteria that are absolutely non-negotiable. One is uh, humility. I think that, um, bringing humility to a job is just, I, I, you can't teach that. And I think that um, wanting to be a part of something bigger than yourself, wanting to contribute, um, not taking things personally, I, that's just such an important part of being on a team. Um, Adam Grant had a podcast about this around the, the superstar. And I just think that, that, that it's such a myth around the superstar of like, you need a team of superstars. No, you need a team of of teammates, right? You need, you need the teammates. Um, and the second is a willingness to learn. Um, I want people to come on our team, be curious, be wanting to try things. I love experimentation. I love encouraging the team to go out and try new things. So um, humility and a willingness to learn. Mm. Um, of course, <laughs> I have a, a team of, of people development business partners. So there's, there's some specific skill sets I look for as well. But I think that um, those are, are two very non-negotiables for me. Jordan's chiming in to asking for a career opening. So I think you've got a, a pipeline opening up over here. Amazing. Um, let's see. How, how do you work on removing the fear of failure for employees? That is um, such a, such a great question and such a, so important to, to me, especially I, I love experimentation and I love pushing people um, to try new things and not everybody has an appetite for that. And I think that stems from them feeling like, if something goes wrong, there's a failure there. So um, one, it's as a manager, just building in that culture of it's okay. Not only is it okay to fail, it's it's encouraged to try things and fail. Um, I always say to my team, if if we're not failing even a little bit, then we're not trying hard enough. You know, we're not pushing ourselves. We're not pushing the limits. Um, and and I think it's okay to and learn. I think it's important to learn from failure. Right? You're you're learning. You're taking these lessons. Um, and I think I saw somewhere that not calling it failure might help. I still call it failure because I, I, I don't have a, a strong reaction to that word. I think of it as a learning experience, um, but you could try that calling it something else. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think that, that encouraging people to think bigger, try bigger things, and then just being super supportive when things don't go well and highlighting it. I, um, I think they saw somebody in a team meeting would highlight their failure of the week or <laughs> things like that. I think that um, making it part of the culture of, of, hey, I tried this thing and it really fell flat. And, um, you know, or uh, I think one of uh, my reports on our team yesterday talked about how he was doing a training and he tried to make a joke. And it, it, I mean, it, I just think that those types of things are, are so important. It's just ke keeping it light, I would say. I love it. If you're not failing a little, you're not pushing the limits. I'm going to write that down. And, and is, it a t is it t-shirt worthy? <laughs> it's t-shirt worthy. You got it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, let's see. Matthew says, great point about putting a focus on humility. Would love to know your specific strategy for feeling that out through the interview process. So how do you identify humility? Um, I, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that Managing teams and building teams is so interesting. So I've seen our people development team be built from a team of, you know, six to 48. So I've seen lots of people be hired. I've seen lots of people come and go um, and, you know, have had to make those decisions myself sometimes. 
And I, it's not a science yet. Um, somebody can, is probably building something around it. Um, but it, it's, it, it's really a, um, a feeling you get from interviewing a lot. Uh, so you, you interview folks, you can get a feeling, you can get a feeling even from a resume um, of how people talk about things. Did they talk about they did it? or we did it, right? Because very, very few times did somebody do something completely by themselves. Um, even I, you know, I, I wouldn't credit any of the work that I talked about today to just me. Um, yeah. We have a huge team of incredible people development professionals working um, at Uber. And, and so I think that it's, it's, it's just how, how folks talk in an interview, how they credit other people, how they say they've worked with other people. Um, and of course, I don't get it wrong. I don't get it, I don't get it wrong all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't get it right all the time. Um, hopefully most of the time I get it right, but um, you know, sometimes you get it wrong and, and uh, you know, that's when radical candor comes in, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I love so, Kim Scott. You're so right that it comes down to reps because, you know, you can you can listen for I's versus we's and you don't know if someone's being uh, humble or if someone just wasn't involved in the projects. And, you know, so you you really have to feel that out. Um, James says, Ooh, this is a good question. How do you manage people that want to try new things but refuse to try the current processes? So they want to innovate and you don't want to um, squash that enthusiasm, but they aren't willing to try how you've done it. Totally. Um, I, think, I think that happens all the time. Um, or there's the other thing, which is people who only want to build new things and don't want to do the things that they're supposed to do. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's kind of human. sometimes human nature is like you want to do the new shiny thing um, or you don't want to try the thing that existed. And um, I, I think that it's a balance, right? Uh, it's uh, a lot of times we put processes in place or things in place for a reason. And I always like to say to my team, don't just accept things because it's the way they are. But if we find out that it's the way they are because of a reason, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. And then it gives us open space to do something new, right? Yeah. It doesn't always have to be on that thing. Um, I often like learning from what other um, teams have done and, and building upon kind of what it currently exists. I think that that's a playground in and of itself. Um, and I just, I don't think that it has to be um, constantly building from zero to one. I think it could be one to two. I think it'd be two to three. Um, and I think that the person who's remaking processes or rebuilding processes for the sake of rebuilding processes, to me, that's just a huge waste of time. Um, and so again, radical candor, why are you doing this? Um, and I think part of it also is building roadmaps, setting expectations and ensuring that people are, are, you know, working towards towards the common goal um yeah. but with that said i always like to say like question why a fork is a fork you know like think about things differently and uh yeah and if you can um if you can encourage that then maybe great new ideas will be brewed yeah, and if it, it, you know to that point if you provide the context for why things are how they are then people don't question it as much whereas if there's no instructions or context on why then they just they they, they want to make up the new way Totally. Yeah. And sometimes things get built, especially in startup land where it's like, I don't remember why we built that. So right. go research that. And if you can't find a good answer and you have a better solution, let's try it. Perfect. Well, Becky, thank you so much for joining us past, present and future. Thank you for leading the way with how to navigate change. I think this is going to be really valuable right now and beyond. So thank you again for joining us today. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thanks for listening to Process Makes Perfect. If you're watching on YouTube, we do have an audio version available everywhere you listen to your podcast, so be sure to check that out. If you liked what you heard, please leave a review and be sure to subscribe to the channel here. And we'd love if you would tell a few friends or family or anyone you think that could benefit from this. You can find me on social media anywhere at Chris Ronzio or the company Trainual, that's train, U-A-L, like a training manual, at Trainual, anywhere you want to follow us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.